Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kasia Kraus. I'm 
the wife of one of the organizers. This is generally how these things go. Um, but I also am somewhat qualified to do this in the sense that I've been a uh, literature fan, a uh, science fiction fantasy fan my whole life, to the point where I actually did a uh, science fiction MA in Liverpool a few years back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it's true. I, have, I am a geek and I have the diploma to prove it. So, um, so it is really my pleasure to introduce Christopher Priest. Chris is right, you Chris, Chris, yeah, okay. Um, and yes, we'll have a little chat today. Um, previously, I'd only read The Prestige a few years back, so I revisited that, because obviously that's the one that most people know because of the movie, obviously. Um, but it was really a pleasure to read some of your other novels as well, because they are, there are some similar themes and topics that kind of go through all of your novels, but, um, you know, they all have, they're all kind of very interesting and unique in their own way. So, uh, those of you who don't know Christopher, I'll just give you a brief overview. Multi-award winning science fiction author. Uh, almost five decades of writing now. <laughs> next year, almost, almost, next year. Um, so, 14 novels, four short story collections, critical works, biographies, novelizations, and children's non-fiction. Does that about cover it? Yeah, okay. Um, and... <laughs> No. <laughs> but your secret is safe. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, so in 1996, you also won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize for The Prestige, and it also won the World Fantasy Award. Now, that's um, the only time that a novel has won a major literary prize, but also a genre award, which has never happened before. So that's very, very rare, which I think goes to show how. Um, how amazing your writing is and how valued it is, not only by sci-fi fans, but also, you know, those, the normals who just read fiction, right? Um, what else have we got here? More awards, The Separation, Arthur C. Clarke Award, um, and the BSFA Award. Um, and then the last thing of all, four um, awards for Best Science Fiction uh, Novel, British Science Fiction Award, four times. So just a few awards, really. No, nothing to, you know, nothing to show off about, really. <laughs> no, fantastic. Uh, so congratulations for all of those. Well deserved. Um, so that takes about 50 years to, to produce, I figure. Um, well done, indeed. Let's start off far, 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 far in the back in your life. Um, what do you think were your greatest influences? Growing? What do you think were your greatest influences growing up? What kind of pushed you towards writing in the fantasy speculative uh, science fiction genre. Okay. Um. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Um, influences. Um, I, I was a reader. I just read science fiction. I thought it was great. I was 18. Good. I, actually, a lot later than some people start reading. Uh, I've always been a late developer, a late, what's the word, a late starter. Okay. Yes, that's right. And. Um, I read science fiction for about three years, more or less uniquely. And then something terrible happened, which was I was invited by a publisher to become a reader of the manuscript. And at the first I thought this was a great honour, and you get to read all these books free, and you know, you get to decide which ones get published, and so forth. And it, it, you know, I'm not complaining about it, except that it really destroyed the idea of reading. As a, as a pleasure, and I just saw it as a job. And I did it for six years, and at the end of those six years, I just never read any science fiction after that. <coughs> and uh, except that there are always exceptions, they're friends, or a particular book comes up that you feel you should read, but I've never really been a science fiction reader since then. So that goes back to about um, 1970s, more or less. No, about 73 was when I stopped reading. So we're talking about 40 odd years. So I'm really, truly, authentically out of date. I'm an old dinosaur. Is that you or me? No, that was just the computer doing something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's so many things in space that go bomb like that. <laughs> Everyone reaches. Um, my, my, I, I'm always careful, careful to talk about influences if you're a writer because it's so easily misunderstood if you say, oh, well, I'm. Influenced by Robert Louis Stevenson, say. Um, it seems to imply that you're trying to 
Colorado emulated. And um, for me, the influences that I count are the ones where a writer or a filmmaker, often a filmmaker in my case, um, kind of opens a door. Sorry. Opens a door so that um, I suddenly see through to something else. And, uh, for me, one of the writers who did this most was J.G. Barrett. Um, I felt he was um, uniquely interesting as a writer, both stylistically and for his ideas. And uh, I found that very important. And um, Brian Aldis, too. I like Brian Aldis's range. I, I, I would say I liked everything Brian wrote, but I really admired his approach to literature. And, um, very prolific, Brian Aldis. Sorry? Very prolific. Very prolific. Very prolific. And, uh, but the final influence was uh, a, a non-science fiction novel called The Magus by John Fowles, um, which if you don't know it, I recommend you to have a go at it. It's quite long, it's quite old now, and in many ways it's a bit deplorable. His attitude to women is a bit, shall we say, old-fashioned. And uh, there are other aspects of it which are a bit dubious now. However, still worth reading. And um, this was a absolutely wonderful example to me of what we could do with literature, which is take on a really serious idea uh, and discuss it thoroughly, and yet make a story which is really interesting and enjoyable. And, uh, the, the weekend I read The Vegas, I practically did nothing else. I just sat there and read and read. I couldn't wait to get to the end and see what's happening. And it, um, again, it was something which revealed to me the possibilities of literature rather than how I want to write. So, in a sense, the genre called to you because that what if question that is so often cited along with science fiction, that, kind of, that idea pulled you in, especially with the style of writing. Yeah. Um, okay, I've uh, also found online that you, well, it says that you are, you were influenced by H.G. Wells, so you can tell us if that's true or not. Um, but also that you're the vice president of the International H.G. Wells Society. Why do you think it's important to maintain his legacy? Well, well this is, um, I, don't, I don't think you can talk about science fiction or think about science fiction without Wells. He's so important. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that H.G. Wells is basically a young writer. You always must remember this. He's a young writer. And as, as, as he got older and older, his books become less and less interesting. But he did, in, when he was about 28, 29, 30, around that sort of age, he wrote five or six of the great classics of science fiction, which are enduring and still well worth reading today. Like books like The um, Invisible Man, War of the Worlds, Time Machine. They are genuine classics, and they don't date, and they, they uh, continue to be important. But the trouble with Wells was he lived a long time and he, he became very uh, self-important. He, he saw himself as a, a spokesman for the common man. Uh, he, he was uh, the sort of Democrat uh, who, who wanted to go and sort out freedom and then present it to the rest of the world as a gift. They, they weren't going to be consulted on the way. And he did this by talking to people like Stalin, <laughs> Roosevelt, ter terrible approach really. But he was ahead of his time. I mean, he uh, he uh, campaigned all his life for what he called a League of All Nations, which became initially um, the League of Nations, which was a kind of failed experiment. But then immediately after the Second World War, the United Nations was formed. And within Wells' lifetime, they made the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And I, <coughs> I saw that very much a culmination of his work. That, that, that's what he really achieved. Okay, thank you, that was a great answer. Um, okay, so kind of moving on from that topic, uh, you've been a full-time writer for a while. Um, at what moment did you kind of realize that you could actually do that, that you didn't need to do anything else, that you could actually live off writing? What, what was that moment for you? Well, I, I discovered you could live without eating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or paying the rent. Um, you, you don't know to be true. I, I feel that I have no particular gifts as a writer. I mean, this quite, I'm not being, it's not false humility. I really feel I, I wasn't born to be a writer. Um, I wanted to become one, and I learned how to do it the hard way. Um, I just tried and tried, kept trying, trying to improve 
Sorry about this. I got a big, huge watch. Right. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, I just um, I kept reading the writers that interested me and thinking, how do they do that? And I looked at it very technically and clinically. And uh, my, I published a book myself, on, um, which is self-published, called um, Ersatz Wines which is my first 12 short stories, and all of these are unpublished. They were the, the 12 things I wrote before I became a writer. And the first story is a serious embarrassment. It's in there. And the second story is a pretty serious embarrassment. And the third story is a serious embarrassment. And by the time you get to the 12th, you can see this writer was on the edge of becoming okay. And I, I call it instructive short stories because they're not instructional and don't teach anything. But it shows you that with work you can find out how to do it. And so uh, that, that's, as for how you can live, um, it, it's not a joke. You, you learn to live on very little. Um, you, you just, uh, I, I lived for years on credit cards. I mean, you talk about prestige. Well, um, they, when you sell a film to Hollywood, they give you a shitload of money. You know, it's, it's yeah. huge money. And it was like, I was nouveau riche, it was fantastic. <laughs> it never had money before. But the first thing I did, literally, that morning, I went down into town and I spent the morning going around to all the people I owed money to and paid them back. I owed, I owed thousands of pounds. And I brought up my family uh, on, on credit cards. And, Every time I had to pay one, was move it over somewhere else. Oh, it's hell, I used to lie awake at night, literally sweating with fear about money. Um, so, um, although in many ways the Hollywood thing solved one problem, uh, I've never forgotten what it's like. And uh, I, I, if ever I hear writers being badly treated, I, I really feel strongly about that. So work hard, writers and audience. Work hard and don't eat. <laughs> okay, so just to kind of move on more specifically to some of your novels. So one of the earlier ones I read was Inverted World. So that's here in the Masterworks issue there. Um, in the introduction, Adam Roberts describes it um, as a tale about the presence of the infinite in the finite. So an infinite world, but only one moving point, the optimum, where humanity can live safely. What sparked the idea for this world and this story? I know, it's, it may be hard to know. wrote the book 45 years ago. It, it's a real test of memory. <laughs> 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 um, Come at it from a different point of view, maybe like what, how, what do you think is still, what still relates to our world then from, the, from some of the issues and things you're going through? Sorry. What, what might still relate to our world now from that novel? Yeah, it, it, I, I, I really don't want to analyse the virtual world because I, I, I don't want to read it again. <laughs> so, I, I quite enjoy it. Yeah, I know people quite enjoy it. I, I, I feel... Um, I, can tell, I can tell you a story about the virtual world. So, when the book came out, it came out in a very bad period. It was at the time of Watergate and the Arab oil embargo, and Britain was suffering constant power cuts. We had no electricity, and it was a really gloomy time. And the book was published, and uh, it got really bad reviews, and it, it was quite very disappointing. And then, about three months later, it came out in America, and it got even worse reviews. And it, it, I was really depressed about that. It, it, so I got to do. The king bad review I got was from the New York Times book, uh, New York Times Review of Books. And the reviewer basically said, science fiction is an inherently American form. It should be written in English by Americans for Americans because we understand the high frontier, freedom, self-expression, self-determination, um, you know, the rights of man, all this kind of thing. Um, Europeans kind of don't count because we, you know, Europe is a hot bed of dispute and, you know, and the English are 
aristocrats and assholes and all this kind of thing. And he finished off by saying, and now, for instance, inverted world. <laughs> so I was being held up as a bad example of everything that was un-American. And I got very depressed about that. Anyway, go forward about 40 years, and about, um, I suppose about eight years ago now, the book was republished in America as a classic. And um, it, it had this unusual thing that when they printed it, they never sent me proofs. Uh, and uh, so I found out on the internet that it was come out, about to appear, so I contacted them and said, am I going to get the proofs before you publish? And they went, ah! They thought I was dead. <laughs> and the reason was they never, they have never had a live author. They've never, and this, pub, and this publisher was the New York Review of Books. <laughs> and uh, the, um, you know, the Chinese say, best revenge, live long. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, okay, so. I mean, I, I, I really liked it in the sense you can tell it's an early novel, you know, certainly in the Islanders, you, you, your, your skill has certainly, you know, uh, kind of improved, if that's the right word, but it developed, evolved, um, you know, everything kind of ties together much more neatly, I suppose. And the batteries are up. Good. Um, in your later novels. Is that right? No, I think the battery went out. Oh, okay. That's right, we'll have to protect. Tell me if you can't hear us, okay? Well, let's come forward if you can't yeah. hear um, So, yes, yeah, so basically, it, in the inverted world, there's a character called Helward Man. Do you want to tell us about his name? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, very kind of about that name. It's fantastic. I just thought it was a cool name. Yeah. And I think said, Helward Man, that's symbolic. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> On some level, he must have meant it to be. Not really. Not really. No, no, no. Yeah. Just a coincidence. I mean, he isn't necessarily Helward, you know, yeah. going, but uh, yeah, but it's, it's an interesting name, nevertheless. Um, so when I was reading it, I felt kind of it, it's a very claustrophobic novel, both in the sense of the the characters' point of view, but also in the place that they live. They live in essentially this kind of island city, the skyscraper that has to constantly keep moving all these tracks because there's only this one place they can live on this planet at, at any one time. So, um, because we only see the world from his point of view, and as, as he kind of finds out about it, we find out about it, he's never really, um, you know, he's, he's the unreliable narrator. We can only understand his world through him, but he himself doesn't understand his world, so we cannot. Um, so ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, he uh, he's not able to understand where he lives because of this. So how do you think? Because for you, I think this this idea of unreliable narrator is something you use quite a lot. Right. Why do you think you do that? Talk, talk to first about inverted world. Okay. The the idea for inverted world was an old one. It was something I conceived when I was reading science fiction. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with it. Knocked around and. Um, in a sense, it was written as a science fiction novel by a science fiction writer. It had no more potential to that. It seemed to me to be a good SF idea, and I could write a good story about it. But through the process of writing it, I discovered the shortcomings of it, the problem with it. And although I wrote it, finished it, sent it in, and it was published in that form, afterwards I thought, I can never do that again. I can't write that kind of book anymore. I must find something more serious. And um, the overall narrator, I, th I think you're the first person who's ever pointed out that Hellwood Man mm -hmm. is a, an overall narrator. So it's, 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 it's very true. clear at the end, I yeah. think, especially. Whereas the, the um, my, my later yeah. books have had much more self-conscious overall narrators because mm -hmm. it seems to me unreliability is the only way to tell the truth in fiction. Mm -hmm. In other words, by telling a book through the eyes of somebody who doesn't quite see everything that's going on, the reader is invited to fill it in. And that doesn't mean I think they should do the work, but I want to provoke their imagination. And um, the, 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 sort of, uh, the sort of thing I have in mind is really a, a matter of, it, of omitting things. If, if, if I tell a story, uh, say, you know, last week I went to um, Paris, 
and I flew on a certain flight, a certain flight number, and it took off and landed at this time. And I got the metro, and I went to see the Eiffel Tower, and I travelled around, and I did this. All of this could be absolutely true, could be checked. Even in the hotel could be checked. I was definitely there. It's all true. And yet, what I haven't told you is that while I was there, I was having an affair with somebody. That I admit. And that, uh, that affair is actually the important. Now, the reader, if you put that sort of thing into a book, the reader cannot assume that there's something else going on. Because all you've got is, as you say, the, the version of the narrator is the, the core version. But it does mean that the, writer, the reader should be feeling, uh, I wonder what else is going on. And open their idea to possibilities. There, there, there is always an awareness of unreliability. Yeah, and it's and really it's it's something that's going on in, in all of it. all yeah. the roles I've read. That is something that's going on definitely. I mean, the affirmation is really really deep deep exploration of that, um, and in the prestige. And we'll get we'll get to that. But there's kind of those three parallel narratives and narration that you have going on. Um, okay, so I was thinking about Luxembourg, where we live. And I was thinking about kind of the way you write about. Um, um, Islands, you know, in your dream archipelago, all these islands and so on. And sometimes it feels to me, because as an outsider living in Luxembourg, that, that it's a little island. I'm that floats there around are many the islands here, rather. No, yeah, but I feel like <laughs> metaphorically, Luxembourg yeah, is like this little island that floats around in Luxembourg, uh, in Europe rather. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's always trying to kind of find its way, maintain its own culture, but it's always under siege, like, you know, on all sides by other really strong. You've got cultures. Germany on one side, France on the other. Exactly. So you know, it, it's. How do you stay, as Luxembourgers say, how do you stay where you are when you've got all these things going yeah. on around you? So in, in one interview of yours, I read online, um, the quote kind of, it's a, it's a mixed up John Donne quote, uh, where it said, all men are islands. Okay, so, and I think that's a really apt way of describing the, one of the main themes of your writing, okay, where the individual is desperately trying to understand himself in the context of his surroundings, family, culture, but, they can't quite figure it out. So the affirmation, for example, is a very is really that for me that in depth exploration of that idea. All men are islands. So you can't ever really know anyone else because you can't really ever even know yourself in a way. So um, those of you who don't know the affirmation, in a very quick synopsis, it's just um, a man who's essentially two men, and you, as you read it, you try to figure out which one is the real one. Is it the one that lives here on our earth, or is it the one that lives in the Dream Arc Archipelago? And both seem as authentic and as real as the other, and it, and it, and it ends in a very um, well. There is no, there is no yeah. clear <laughs> um, kind of you know which one is it, and I think that's kind of the point <laughs> in the end. But yes, yeah, so do you want to kind of comment on this idea of an island out to yourself? What, why do you feel that that's maybe true? I think we're here. Everyone sitting here, we're all individuals. Yeah. You know? All these people here, they look like a crowd to us, but they're not. You know, they're, everyone's individual. And uh, it, it's the, the illusion of tyrants, mm -hmm. bastards, that people aren't, that they're all one thing. Uh, Martin Trump is a feeling of, uh, I can generalize about. It. Whereas for me, my personal identity, I don't think it's any stronger or more interesting than anyone else's, but to me it's very important. Driving the crowd of people, I feel I'm surrounded by a Chris shaped force field that protects me from the rest of them. Um, but then within that is the this feeling of what do I know? I mean, here we are, we're sitting here. We're, Perceiving the world around us, are we perceiving it the same way? I was talking yesterday and I was doing a reading about um, the old psychological thing of if I see a colour, red or green, and you and I agree that that's red and that's green, but do you and I see the same colour? Do, how would we ever know? You know, maybe the universe in China is unique, and, um, you, you, but day to day living, there's a consensus acceptance a kind of working reality that we all accept. You know, you go outside and breathe the air and get on the train and fly away and see your friends. 
if all these things work, they don't stop working. But however, there should always be a question of, I wonder if that is all there is to the world. And that's really what the application is. That's a fascinating um, that I was really gripped by, by the moment when, um, when his sister was visiting him. And I was convinced he was going to kill he didn't, but I, I, really, I thought that somehow that, he did. I was waiting to see if she turned up again. Oh. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the thing about the sister is, that is my sister. <laughs> and, uh, I was born exactly five years after her. We have the same birthday. She's still alive. And uh, I've always been terrified of her. And uh, she still hates me. And uh, I haven't spoken to her for 12 years. It's really a very, very bad relationship. Uh, I, I put her in the book. I thought, the hell, you know, settle on the score. To, to draw. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep that to That's ourselves. That's what you did to me on my 12th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's move on to the Dream Archipelago. Okay. It's a setting you return to often. Yeah. Uh, most recently in the Islanders, so that's one of the most recent books that you've published. Um, can you explain the concept of the alternative Earth that you've created and why you keep going back to it? Right, it's not a real place, it's, it's an imaginary world, it's a functioning world, it has all sorts of problems and things go wrong, it has the internet, it has um, a sun and a moon, it has languages, it has um, bad governments and good governments, it has beautiful places and ugly places. But most of it is islands, and each of the islands is independent of all the other islands and uh, each one has a kind of benign feudalism as a, as a system and that is the canvas and I go to it as a, a way of focusing on particular islands and then writing about them. The, uh, you mentioned the Islanders. The Islanders is a novel which consists of I think 57 short pieces, <coughs> each one of which is focused on a particular island. And each one is different from all the others. Uh, but as you go along, you, you, you realise there is a story in there. Um, I've written actually two more books since then about the islands. Um, so the, the most recent one is called The Gradual, which came out last year. And uh, that's about. Um, I, I always saw the Dream of Japan with story as essentially about art, but, um, uh, largely about filmmaking, also about painting and literature. But the, the gradual, which is the most recent one, it's about music. And the central character is a composer, it's a modernist composer. And he finds inspiration from the islands he can see where he lives. He, he hears music and so writing. And then one day he, he gets the opportunity to travel in the islands. He gets on a boat and he visits several islands. When he returns, he discovers that there's been a time slip that he's uh, moved forward about two or three years into the future. And when he gets back, his wife has left him, his parents are dead, he's about to lose his house, all sorts of things go wrong. So he sorts that out. But then the second half of the book, he decides to return to the islands, essentially to find out what was happening. And through that, he then discovers the, the nature of artistic inspiration. Um, uh, how that affects music, how artistic inspiration, the idea of music is that artistic inspiration is consensual, uh, con consensus. In other words, artistic inspiration is available for anyone. It's just who makes music. So, uh, because he, he actually meets a character who has drawn the same inspiration. Never met him on the other side of the world. And they both been writing the same music. And uh, this is rather shocking to him. But, uh, this is based on the fact that a bastard in America took my name from me. You, 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 have you heard about that? Yeah. Somebody changed his name to mine. And he's a writer. More successful than me, where he is now. He's going to try to write on your cocktails in the world. Well, it was, I think it was doing the prestige. Yeah, it was, yeah, Thank you. It was uh, around the time of the prestige came yeah. out. He changed his name. Uh, his real name is James Alston. Uh, he writes comics for Marvel. And uh, he didn't used to write comics for Marvel. He wrote comics for small 
publishers. He now writes for Marvel. So he's famous in the world of comic. But the problem is he's got the same name as me. I find it very I get emails. Yeah, Google me. Why do you think you choose artists as your protagonists? Sorry. I think it's an interesting perspective to want to look at the world because they, can in a way, bring each of the artists to life through their artistic vision. Yeah. And that works really well. Yeah. Okay. So what do I want to ask you more? Let's see. So yeah, the Islanders. I mean. This book kind of blew my mind because I have never read anything like this before. Ever, in science fiction. Ever, ever, really. I, I would highly recommend it. It's a slow burn, but once you kind of start to understand what Chris is trying to create here, it's a fascinating read. It's, it's basically, it's more like a travel narrative. And then there are these snippets or these interludes of, of characters that tell kind of short, short stories within the overarching uh, description, explanation, um, travel of. of islands themselves. Um, at the core of it there is a kind of murder mystery, but it's it's a loose, loose kind of tie kind of in the middle of the middle of the story. Um, but really it's how you bring this world to life. That kind of it's so true, it's so real. It's, uh, it's a kind of lonely yeah. planet guy. Yeah, that's, but yeah. it's fascinating because really never ever have I read anything quite like this where where you've abandoned you know, people, humans, characters in a way, yeah. and the islands themselves become characters. So, why did you choose to focus on on the landscape? Did the, like, does the dream archipelago speak to you in such a way that the, the islands themselves almost become characters? I suppose. I wrote five short stories about the dream archipelago, and then stopped. I wrote the affirmation, which also deals with the dream archipelago. That was over by 1980. Mm -hmm. In about 25 years later, I got interested. And I couldn't remember what I'd done. So I read them again and I found all these names of islands that were really confusing. And I didn't know where they were, what they were. So I created a number of computer, a, a database with all the island names, what I knew about them, where they were, and all that. And uh, so then I started writing more dream papers and I had the database. And then one day I thought, this is a short story. You know, like J.G. Ballard did a story called The Generations of America, mm -hmm. which began with uh, you know, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald shot John Jeff Kennedy. Mm -hmm. you know, all these people shooting each other. I thought, you know, that bad idea. Why did a sort of lonely planet guy mm -hmm. to, to what I know about the island? So that's how it started. So it began with sort of recommendations of where you could get the best search. <laughs> It's not like a sales pitch where you, as well. Where you, take the, <laughs> where you can go. Where you can take the children, <laughs> yeah. where you can get sex, where you can yeah. get drugs, yeah. and all where to avoid. And all the stuff, fun stuff. Yeah. And then gradually, I got interested in this uh, woman who was an artist, who her art was uh, driven tunnels, which I discovered since I've been in uh, Luxembourg, full of tunnels. And, uh, but she actually draws new ones, and then sort of uses them as kind of uh, wind channels. Yeah. So she can make music with mountains. I thought that was quite like that. It's very interesting. And the story kind of grew from there. And uh, as you say, it's, it's unusual. Yeah, but it works really well and I highly recommend it, definitely. Um, okay, so let's move, I suppose, full circle, prestige again a little bit. Um, you write this in the prestige. Um, the magician takes the ordinary something and makes it do something extraordinary. Now you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it, because of course you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. You want to be fooled. I was thinking this relationship did between... Did you write that or did you feel right? No, I think you're a little too. This relationship... Some bits in the film are better than the book. <laughs> no, that's from the book. So this relationship between magician and audience, in a way it's a metaphor for author and reader relationship, oh, yeah. isn't it? Um, do you think we want to be fooled into believing what you say? And, and how much of, how much do you try to fool us as a writer? No, fooling is the wrong word. Yeah. It, it is really the wrong word. It's, uh, again, it, 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 he talks about the pact, acquiescent sorcery, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, when you see a magician perform, you know, he knows, it's fake. Yeah. And what the judge is not what he does, but how well he does it. And I think that's really what literature 
you know, we've heard here this weekend. There's no new ideas, no new stories, no things that regurgitate constantly. So what writers try to do is not come up with something completely fresh, but a completely fresh way of doing it. And I, I find magicians uh, very interesting that. They, 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 within about three months of mobile phones coming into popular use, there were dozens of tricks they could do with mobile phones. You think, oh, they're just waiting for the next thing to come along and do it. And so, uh, so it is a really, I see magic as a metaphor for the storytelling. And uh, if you think about it, every trick that you see is not a story. It has no, it has a plot development, it has a surprise, it has a revelation. And so I, I use that to go The film kind of uh, bangs on about it much more. But um, uh, I always enjoy You see, the other thing that's uh, interesting to me is something called misdirection. And the magicians use misdirection all the time, and it's fascinating. They, what, they, what misdirection is, it's not uh, doing clever things, it's actually not doing things. And, uh, no, no, it's not even that. What it is, a, a typical example would be a magician would take that pack of cards and you'll hold it up and he'll open it. You'll, you'll discover it's got cellophane around it. He makes a crackling noise on the side. Then he takes the cards up and they're wrapped in paper. He'll take the paper off and he does this with the cards. Now, what do you know about that pack of cards? What you know is it's brand new. Right? So he can't have fixed it. But that's what he wants you to think. He doesn't actually tell you that, but he just does everything you can expect him to do. And so, because that pack of cards has been set up in the rain, he's, he's done this trick. The a similar example, which I think is in the film, is uh, a birdcage. If you've ever been near a birdcage, the one you know is it's rigid, and it rattles, and it's got sharp bits, and you know. And you often see a magician with a birdcage, there's something will appear in it and disappear from it. And you think, oh well, that's a bird cage. But in fact, in fact, it's one which is designed to go flat you know, immediately and silently. And in a way you behave in a way you can't expect it to do the moment you see it. So it's expectation versus, versus it's the reality of the Yeah, it's, it, it's just um, you know, you, you sort of you prepare, you prepare the audience based on their assumptions. And that is what I was talking about the other and out of the way. It's the same thing. Where you, if somebody says, I did this, I saw that, I said this, you assume that that person is telling you. This is actually brings me to, to my next question, which works Christine really well, because we make these assumptions. As the story is revealed to us, we make certain assumptions and occasionally misdirect us. But then when we get onto the other character's point of view or their duration, we get all these other new facts and, and, and new yeah. things come into play. And then we realize, oh, right, no, he's not actually the villain. In this case, it's actually yeah. the other way around, and and so and, and you're always building on that. And I think it's a really uh, kind of amazing way to have of adding information, and giving us more and more information, so we can build the story kind of more holistically. Because again, reality is not as we thought it was. No. <laughs> and you, you know, it's it's. I think it takes all of those people to tell us the whole story. Because before we just had the parts, and that's I think a really interesting thing that you do with all of your writing. Thank um, you. So, um, was that the question? Yeah, no, it was just a comment, really. Um, so, uh, I'll show you here. You have already talked about this a little bit, but you were not involved in the adaptation of the script. Or, no. Yeah. So, but ultimately, how did you feel about the movie? Was it kind of generally true to the novel itself, or how, how did you feel about it? Um, the important thing about the prestige film was really the memento, the film you made before. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, it was one of those things, the book came out, I didn't write it with any expectation other than it would be a book. And, you know, no, no thought it would become a major Hollywood book, because so it was. Um, and uh, about four years after it was published, there was a review in the American magazine called Entertainment Weekly. And the reviewer said, this book would make a great movie. And the next thing that happened was, I started getting letters from famous people, like Steven Spielberg, um, I, I, many more, I can't remember off the top of my head. 
And of course you realise quickly, it's not actually from Steven Spielberg, but from some unpaid intern working in the office who'd been given a job while we were sitting there. Please, Mr. Prince, can we have a coffee if you're not? Because we're thinking of making a film out of it. He said, good, send it on. And then next week, ten more arrive. And you've run out of books, so you can buy them. And so you send those off. And then next week, ten more come in to buy more books to send off. And I sent off about two hundred books. Holy shit, I hope they went to the film because it was really expensive. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it seems a bit odd to be buying your book. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was, it was, it, I mean, I wasn't, I, I said earlier, I was broke. I yeah. really, genuinely broke. And I kept thinking, really, I thought, you know, I was supposed to make money from this. Not <laughs> <laughs> In the end, I got three offers. Came back. And one was from a British TV channel which was very nice. I'd met the director and I'd met this guy who wrote the script. They're very good, sincere people. And I'd seen the films they'd made, very good. Like, but the money was very really good. And then the second one was from Sam Mendes. Now Sam Mendes had just made a film at that time for American Beauty. And on the day I got the offer, I found out that he was up for seven Oscars in the including the best director and best film. And he offered Hollywood money. And so I said to the agent, I said, oh, yeah, great, we're there. Yeah. And then the third offer was from somebody called Christopher Nolan. And I'd never heard of Nolan. Nobody had. Uh, and so uh, I said, get them in this offer. And the agent then spoke to the Nolan office. And they said, tell Christopher Priest to wait, there's a motorbike coming. And about an hour later, the motorbike came to my house. They gave me a VHS. Yeah, that's how long ago it was. Yeah. And on it was a post-it note which said, Dear Chris, just look at this video before you decide what you know, what this is going to see what you do. Oh yeah, try to imagine what this young filmmaker could do with the facilities of a Hollywood studio. So I put it in, it's following. It's, I don't know if you've ever seen following. It's quite crude. Uh, it's obviously an amateur film. It may be bad actors, but it's got an imagination and I really like that. I thought there's something about this and I thought he's a young writer, a young filmmaker, I'd rather go with him than with him. So I turned out the Mendes offer and <laughs> the Mendes said, you're mad. And I said, well, I sort of believe in you. I you have to do it. So we, we took the note on them. Go with your gut, go with your feeling. For your yeah. feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, the, it takes Hollywood about, because the, the deal was done with Warner Brothers, so you have to kind of wait for that. And they're awful. They're assholes. <laughs> they're terrible. It takes about six months for a contract to agree. And I got the contract one day. And that night, I went to see a movie called The Mentor, directed by Christopher Murray, written by his brother John. And it was exactly what they'd said. So I went to the and that it was him. With, his, with the facilities of the Hollywood studio. And I, do you know the Mentor? Yeah. You know, I think it's a superb film. Yeah. And I actually think it's his best film too. And so I said, that's it. I've made the right decision. So, so that's how I felt. But, uh, I've never really regretted it. Oh, well, that's not the film. Um, the thing is, I don't actually like Christopher Nolan movies. <laughs> I think The Prestige is his second best film. I think The Momento is still the best film. Um, the Prestige is a close second. I really dislike his later films. The Batman films, I think, are brisbane. And Inception and Stella, I think, are seriously bad movies. And I think when you watch them again, you'll see why. Um, but uh, I thought The Prestige was pretty good. There's some good things in it. There, there is some film filmic interpretation in the film of scenes in the book which are a bit laboured and clunky and he does it very professionally and very well and I like that I thought it's good but I didn't like the ending I thought the ending of the film was poor um, yeah, because you've also doubled and you wrote uh, Time for Existence because you don't know, you know that, that happened that was, that was a lot of, I remember that one ages ago um, but also a bit of a uh, 
Dr. Kuba, that that never kind of seems to <laughs> work out. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not in yeah, this place. Yeah, so <laughs> overall, overall, your experience, I think, with, with Hollywood or TV film yeah. industry, how do you feel about it overall as an author? Uh, um, well, not much. Uh, yeah. The Doctor Who experience was awful. That's a shame that that didn't kind of come to fruition. Yeah, it was, it was a horrible, yeah. bad experience. Yeah. The existence, you know, that's. Um, see, the, the thing is, with a media novelization, you haven't seen the film and you don't know what it's going to be like. It had, for instance, it had Jude Law in it. Mm -hmm. Jude Law is an English actor, very English looking, very acrylic good looks, very posh accent, and very sort of English manners. And yet he was an American film. Now, from the script, I couldn't decide how he should be described. Was he going to be doing an American accent? Was he going to be an Englishman in America? Or what? I don't think yeah. you know. So that was difficult. And then there were sex scenes in it. The sex scenes were difficult because until you see the film, in the script it says, um, they take their clothes off and go to bed. That's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and are you going to have ten minutes of bonking? <laughs> or is it they're going to close the bedroom door? You don't know. Yeah. And so you have to kind of You're right from the script and they don't even show you. They don't show you. So, I mean, other, other than the big box of drawers, it's a complicated, complicated relationship with all of it. Oh, it is. Yeah, you don't get big box of drawers in conversation. Yeah. But, um, but I, I have to say, the shitload of money is very Yeah, always, yeah. Always. Um, so, is there something you're working on now that you're looking forward to? Or? Well, I don't know whether you look forward to it. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm writing about. Uh, comes up with a, a conjecture. It's going to be, I should uh, don't tell the publisher it's going to be called the conjecture. But uh, you tell them that they put it in the catalog and it's you're stuck with it. Um, it's about a mathematician who conjectures a particular theorem, which is actually a world shattering importance. And uh, he doesn't know how to deal with it. So, so it's not a dream of it. I want to open it up to the audience if there are about 10 minutes like that. Anyone's questions? Well, seven minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My watch is there. Come on, you must have heard this a million times. What's your favourite of your own books? <laughs> favourite? Of your own books? Yes. Oh, shit. Well, the, I always <laughs> say the application is a key novel. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's my best novel, but it's got all the stuff in it that interests me. I mean, when you were saying it, so. Almost like the one I've just written. But then you see, like, the one I've just written is The Gradual. Mm. And I was looking at it uh, the other day on the computer. And I was thinking, oh God, oh, how often? Oh, I can't even know I've had done that. And so the one I realised when I wrote it. The Prestige, uh, when I wrote it, I hated it. I really had a bad experience. It, was, it took two and a half years to write. I was really broke. We had two young kids, babies. Trying to bring them up on low level, very traumatic experience for them. And uh, I, I hated the book so much, I was never going to start and pursue it because I sold it in advance and I thought it's a, a career ender. What do you know? Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is also a question you must have heard a million times. I must ask you to speak up because I'm a bit um, deaf. So how does it feel like if you meet people who have seen the prestige but in fact they have no idea who you are? Because I think with a famous movie like The Prestige there's a lot of people who don't even realise it's based on a book. Yeah, so they don't realise the writers write films. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> Well, I don't meet many people anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do, it's usually something like this yeah. where people know what I do. Um, I, I, I've been a few lot, but it's actually quite serious. I don't do. But, um, I, I mean, it, it's... Uh, uh, I, I can't really answer, I'm sorry. I'd like to, I just don't want to say. like somebody starts speaking to you about the prestige of the movie and not realising that you're actually... No, no one's ever done that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, though. Um, I've seen it four times in the cinema. And all four times, 
the audience has sat in key silence in the film. They've listened to it. And I think that's so interesting. And the other thing is, invariably, as I walk down the stairs with everyone else, people say, what the fuck happened? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really yeah. seriously, because yeah. I didn't get that. What the hell happened there? Yeah. Complicated for no offence, American yeah. audiences. Yeah. Um, okay, any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Well, you have five minutes. I know. Well, I have a very quick one. I was reading um, SFX a few weeks back, and there was a very tiny, tiny, tiny little article in there that you've been commissioned to write something for a 20, 2084 anthology. Oh true? yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, like uh, basically, so like 1984, 100 years yeah. in the future. So is that, is that something you can tell us a bit about? Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a, a commemoration of George Orwell. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the other story is like. Mine is called Shooting an Episode, um, which is a sort of reference to one of his best essays, which is called Shooting an Elephant. And in Shooting an Elephant, he describes a, a manager when he was a, a police officer in Burma and a rogue elephant ran into the village and it fell to him to shoot with it. And, uh, and he found this brilliant essay because he takes his rifle and the whole village follows him. And he realised that the whole reputation of the British Empire rests on this sort of shooting this poor elephant which by now is called not rogue and he's eating cabbages or something. And so he feels very sorry for it. Did he and uh, I decided to do the same thing with a uh, shooting virtual reality film. And so it's called Shooting the Office. But uh, that, uh, that book is uh, it's coming out in June or July. Yeah. There's, I think, uh, some other book. Do you think that there as well? I don't know. Yeah. So that uh, should be interesting. Any offers in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're already published. He's so that doesn't count for you. Uh, but yeah, just any kind of, you know, I mean, you've mentioned already, you know, just you need to do it, you need to write every day. But any other kind of basic advice, kind of rule of thumb that you have for aspiring writers? Um, never give up. Never do less than your best. Don't read people's views. Do read them. <laughs> I kind of read them in a funny voice, so that's <laughs> Actually, I think that's the best part. I'm always amused by any kind of reaction, and I find that you always get everything and its opposite. So, yeah. I just love this part. Yeah, of the reviews. Yeah. yeah, but I can't take it seriously. I mean, sometimes you find something, oh, they're actually right. But most of the time, you see that well, they can't agree amongst themselves, so how am I going to take anything personally? It's obviously the reader. I was talking to Ped about this. When, when the Prestige came out as a, as a film, uh, they sent me all the reviews of the film, and most of them were very good And so every morning, I turn on my computer, 200 more reviews of this bloody film. Almost without exception, the reviews were the same thing. Because when you go to a press show, they give you a press show, which is the plot synopsis and all the actors and what the actor is. And these, these so-called journalists would copy out stuff from the press, press And then the last paragraph would be, I didn't like this film, or I did like this film. That was the review. And it, to me, it brought home how kind of like, damaging that to the spirit. I mean, if, I, if no one has taken it seriously, give up. Because people aren't watching the film. They're, they're kind of getting drunk in the corner or something. Like that. And, but one of the advantages to the writer of books is that you get reviews. They do tend to read the book and they do tend to give themselves. And as you say, you've got a different sort of thing. But uh, I, I, I don't take too much notice of the reviews. I don't want the writer to say this. But the thing is, you write the book, and then 18 months later, the book comes out. And 18 months at that time, you've probably written another book. You've grown up, you've, you're 18 months older, you've traveled, and you've met new friends, and you, you know, you've done everything. And all of a sudden, there's people talking about a book you wrote 18 months before. And there is a distance. Does that help? It helps a bit. But if they like it, you think, oh, that's good. <laughs> they don't think, well, they're also going to work.
Thank you.